well, at least for our house, uh, sickness has not been proven to be a big crippling effect on our own lives. Brooke and I are not necessarily very sickly people. And in fact, when I got married, I actually told Brooke uh, something like, congratulations, I never get sick. And uh, I think I've gotten sick like five or six times since we've been married. And it's actually Brooke who's the strongest of the two. It was always in pride that I would say, my immunity is very strong or my system is never compromised. Uh, I once had a friend who was trying to play a joke on another friend by taking what he thought was an empty cup of coffee and acting like he was going to pour it over a computer. But he not only acted like he poured it over a computer, he did pour it a computer, and it cost him his next month's salary. And it was funny for the rest of us, except for my friend and that guy who had to do it. It's amazing what just a small bit of water can cripple something like a computer. Or you might hear a ringing in your car, and you know that you may not make it to work. Or a clanking sound in your HVAC system You just hope that it's not 95 degrees tomorrow if that proves to be true. It's amazing even what our bodies can do in large part to help us live yet another day. And there are some of you who who live in real fear over your body being compromised by something as small as a cold or something as big as coronavirus or even something like as disastrous as cancer, something is impacting your body in such a way that it is starting to shut down. And one of the big fears of all of us, maybe as you grow older or maybe you've contracted something that actually permanently causes your body to no longer fight off a disease or no longer fight off a sickness where you are completely compromised to the point of you are going to die, much like how water can ruin a computer, a sickness can take your life. And it's been said that a church without proper church discipline is like a body that cannot fight off disease. A church that doesn't practice either corrective or formative, which we'll talk about in a little bit, corrective or formative church discipline is like a body that is no longer able to fight off disease. Now, an immunodeficiency disorder prevents a body from fighting off infections and diseases, and this type of disorder makes it easy for you to catch a virus, and in the same way, I want you to think about a church that doesn't discipline itself or doesn't correct itself is left in the same sense of despair. Now, church discipline, so we've been, if you're new with us this morning, first of all, my name's Asher, welcome. Uh, There aren't lights turned on up here, the lightning struck, and so I'm not glimmering in a great glow like I would normally (laughs) want to, so if you're watching online or you're watching this video later, It is unintentionally darker up here, but if you just now joined us for the first time, this is the fourth week of a sermon series I'm calling Church... Dwight, turn the the light off, okay? No one... (laughs) Someone give that guy a cup of coffee and you can pour it over. (laughs) We've been in... uh, This is now the fourth week of a series that I'm calling Church Matters, where we're thinking about the things that make us a church or hold us together as a church. So you might think of church membership being like a front door, or you think of the ordinary means of grace that allow us to seek the Lord in joy just by doing regular basic things, or you you think of this week in particular, church discipline, almost like the back door of the church. Now, just to define it, church discipline is authority that is delegated to the church, meaning the church as a whole, delegated to the church by Jesus for the purpose of maintaining order through consistent instruction and teaching, and also through correction of those who are in persistent sin. So church discipline is authority that is delegated to the church by Jesus for the purpose of maintaining order through consistent preaching and teaching and instruction, and also through correction of those who are persistent in their own sin. Now, the reason that Jesus gives the church authority as a whole in administering church discipline is to encourage Christians toward and in joy-filled, spiritually driven, scripturally saturated growth. The reason that Jesus gives church discipline to the church, you can think of it most basically, is for our joy and also for our love in preserving or snatching or upholding those who are caught in sin. Church discipline is not only for our joy, like you think of an athlete growing in strength 
and endurance, but also it's for the sake of snatching those who are going wayward or those who are going in their own sin. Now, there are two pursuits of church discipline, and this morning we'll briefly cover one and more long form cover the other one. There are two pursuits in church discipline. Think of it like you would think of your house. Sometimes your house needs repairs. Every house needs a repair. And sometimes your house needs maintenance, and there's a difference between those. Sometimes you might need to repair something, like something broke, and sometimes you might just need to maintain something, like checking the hoses on a vent or checking a door, making sure it can lock. You, you maintain, but also you repair. Both ho- or houses need both. Something breaks down, and you can't ignore it. Something needs maintaining, and if you ignore that, then it will most definitely break down. But the bulk of my sermon today is what the Bible will say about church discipline pertaining to the maintenance of our own church life. I want to briefly address the idea of repairing our church life. Or most briefly, I want to show you the outline of what is called corrective church discipline. So turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. If you were uh, following along where Terrell read earlier, go to your left if you're unfamiliar with the Bible. Matthew chapter 18 where we see here first, there, there are two main points this morning, and they'll have subpoints within them, but the first main point is that there, the Bible gives us a way for the church to correct itself, or the Bible gives us a way for our church to repair herself. So we see within Matthew 18 that there is corrective discipline that is a practice that occurs regularly within a church, and it's intended to keep God's people on a path of perseverance and to exhort one another under discipline to repent. So you can see this pattern that's been given to us in Matthew chapter 18 by Jesus for the church, meaning all of us, to correct people who we love actually from their sin. So we're correcting them from their sin that they're pursuing. You see this most dominantly in Matthew chapter 18, where you see in verses 15 through 20, where Jesus describes a very upfront approach to church discipline. And we see here that corrective discipline deals with a direct confrontation of the church towards someone who is pursuing sin without repentance. So let me just read to us from Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. If a brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses." If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if one or two agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father who is in heaven, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Now what Jesus does here is he commands believers who have been sinned against to go directly to the person who has sinned against them to see if they can restore that relationship through repentance, through mutual repentance, or one person repenting to another. And if reconciliation does not take place, then that person is told to get two or three others to be brought alongside in order to to help Uh, ante up, if you would, and help restore the relationship there. And if there's no reconciliation at that point, so if one person goes and a group goes and that person is still not apologizing at all, then Jesus says, take the matter, not to the elders, not to the deacons, not to a big subset of the group, not to the newspaper, but to the church and take it to the church so that the sinner can be confronted corporately. Now, if this does not achieve the goal of reconciliation, the person is to then be removed from membership of the church and to be treated as a Gentile and a tax collector, or most definitely to be treated as an unbeliever. Now, just to give a caveat there, how is the church called to treat unbelievers? Well, with a lifestyle of grace and with a lifestyle of promoting mercy, with a lifestyle of telling the gospel and trying to continually draw that person back to the faith that they once confessed. It's basically just the church saying about someone in particular, we do love them, but we do not consider them as one of us in faith, though we might consider them as a friend or a neighbor or whatever. And so the the theological term there is called excommunication, where who is invited to the table that we'll partake of later, but those who are in Christ. 
And the action of excommunicating someone is not to shun them or to kick them outside of town or never talk to them, but rather just say, this meal that has been given to us by Jesus is for those who place their faith and trust in him, who have returned from their sins and repented of their sins to him. So it's just this long form, long way of going to someone incessantly again and again and again and seeking their repentance. And so corrective discipline is basically a guarding of the gospel. It is the church sticking up for, not ourselves or our own way of living, but for the very gospel of Jesus, affirming sincere professions and excluding hypocrites and cherishing repentance. A church, a people do this because they are committed not to my truth or our truth or our statement of faith, but the very faith that has brought us from bondage and into life. As God has identified them as people to himself, distinguishing them from the world, calling them to righteousness, making them his own witnesses, using them as a display of his own glory, we are given the task and delegated the task to say, if you live a life of unrepentance, we will love you, just not as a member here, which means we'll probably love you harder and harder because we want you to turn to the Lord in repentance. Now, here's the kicker. As such, God calls for believers to gather together locally, to partake of the ordinances collectively, to exercise the authority of the keys of the kingdom, to fulfill one another or the one another commands. And he also commands them to hold one another accountable to that same faith. It is a joyful thing to be held accountable by other people. And sometimes things seemingly get out of control because of man's own depravity. So I want you to turn, secondly, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We, we've given a clear-cut example of what church discipline looks like by Jesus himself, and then we have a bright, I'll call it a vibrant view, of what is a command given to us by Paul, an apostle. Here in 1 Corinthians 5, the church at Corinth had a lot of problems, and Paul addresses these problems in his letter to them, and he also addresses the report that he had received to the Corinthians' toleration of a specific case of sexual immorality within the church. So they hadn't been dealing with sin. And the sins they had been ignoring were quite serious. It it was gross physically for this sin to be lived out. It was also hierarchically oppressive, meaning there was emotional, you could say, overpowerment over someone. So we might see that the person here who is pursuing sin is having a power over a lesser person that they were still in pursuing sin. So there was physical things going on and emotional things going on. But either way, we see this as a case of, of gross sexual immorality. A man had gotten together with his stepmother and the church was tolerating it because, well, you can imagine all the things that we tend to tolerate things with. You can imagine it wasn't the worst thing that could happen ever. And so you just sweep it under the rug. Or no one's dead. So like, if we just kind of ignore it, maybe it'll work itself out. And, you know, love is love, so if this person wants to be with that person, it's okay as long as they're nice to each other and we'll just pretend that everything is going okay. And, but we're also talking about a powerful person here, possibly a rich person who would have emotional dominance over someone else. So if we go after this person, you can imagine it being said in the church, oh, if you go after that person, they actually tithe like 20% of our church's budget. So if we, if we like, remove them, we won't have air conditioning. And so we just kind of sweep it under the rug. Or they were an influential person. Do you know who they're related to? Do you know how long they've been involved in this church? Yet it was Paul saying that this sin is sin, no matter what it involves or no matter the stature of the one who's pursuing it. And the church's tolerance of this sin equates to them as a church living as non-Christians because they should know better the death You think about the the obedience of a Christian comes out of the very death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus because it was the death of our Lord Jesus that demands that we live a new life that renounces all sin and lives righteously. And when sin finds its way into the church and tolerated by believers, sin becomes incredibly damaging not only to the church uh, through distorting uh, distorting the gospel's view but also damaging to the pristine church showcase of that very gospel to the world. So when sin is allowed to wreak havoc within a church, it actually causes us to not view the gospel well, but it also says to an outside world, that gospel is worthless. 
Because we can do stuff out here like they can do in there. Why would I ever want to hear about the gospel when you guys tolerate adultery or sexual deviancy or drunkenness or relational nastiness and slander? We've got that out here. Why would I ever go there? And what Paul did is he told them to particularly go after this situation. In verse 9 through 11, he actually says, don't associate with a professing, quote, professing Christian who lives unrepentantly in gross sin. He says, don't even eat with them. Now, what this means, many of us believe that it means is uh, that we think this is referring to the Lord's Supper. Keep them away from Christ's ordinance if they defame his grace and mercy. Paul says that God judges those outside the church, but the church, in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, is called and commanded to judge our own members. He says, purge the evil person from among you. So God's gospel calls the church to repair itself when it's in sin by pursuing church discipline. We see this in Matthew 18 and in 1 Corinthians 5, these big cases, case studies, if you will, of what does church discipline look like. And and frankly, church discipline is hard. It is difficult because it's gotten to that nth degree. But Jesus says it is right and it is godly. And often it's the hard right thing that is always superior than the easy wrong thing. So Christians and the church in particular as an organization or embassy of heaven is called to discipline ourselves even when actions seem to be gross. Now, oftentimes I will call people and say, hey, I'd love to go get coffee. And their initial thought is, what have I done? Or I email someone, hey, want to get coffee tomorrow at 9? And their response is, why? And I'm like, I just want to hang out. You know, I just want to talk to you. But now I do want to know why, right? So we, how do, you might think of this and go, okay, Matthew 18, 1 Corinthians 5, how do I keep myself out of church discipline? Or how do I grow in godliness to where church discipline isn't something that's ever taken out on me? And what we see here is the second, the second angle of church discipline. If the first angle is corrective church discipline, you might think about repairing something that's broken in your life. The second way to view church discipline is formative church discipline, where we see that the Bible actually aims to form us as believers, and it's called disciplining ourselves in godliness. We all need to be disciplined regularly. Now, discipline isn't just a negative reaction within the church. Think of their own life. Any, any you, anything that you work for, It takes discipline to carry that out. It takes discipline to achieve different things that you've placed in your own lives. In the Christian life, we're not saved from our sin to then be passive or lazy or non-disciplined living people. The Christian life is actually one of drive and discipline. And this is called formative church discipline, where where we're formed as believers by the very gospel that saved us. So it's the gospel that brought us out into bondage, but that same very recognition of the gospel that actually grows us into godliness, and that's called church discipline. Now, frankly, that is basic to understand. You can understand corrective discipline and also formative discipline, and you can understand the concept of a house needing to repair or needing maintenance, but there's going to be some, or many of you who go, am I being formed by the gospel? Just in maybe reaction as you go to lunch today or mow your yard this afternoon or something. Am I being formed by the gospel? Am I being disciplined in godliness? Am I being trained up in holiness by what the Bible is calling me to do? Am I under formative church discipline? Because it was Paul saying to his saying of his own life that he longs to know Christ and be like him. He says, not that I have already obtained this or have already been made perfect, but I press on. He's disciplining himself toward godliness. So I want you to turn over to the book of Ephesians, where we started out, Ephesians chapter 4. And I hope that these next couple of subpoints serve as like a meditation of the text for our time this morning. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24, where Paul here is assuming that the readers of this letter, the, the people of the church of Ephesus, have already heard the gospel. They've heard the gospel, they believed in that gospel, he has said in this text, and he's instructing them, though, how to live within that gospel truth. Remember the narrative that we've looked at for a long time in the book of Matthew, and how Matthew leans so much on the narrative of the book of Exodus, how the Christian life is to be seen as being brought out of bondage and into a new life, and then given 
a way of obedience and righteousness to pursue. So we're brought from our sins and given by God a new way to live. And he's telling them to be disciplined to that end. I am free, no longer in bondage, and I've been given a new life. And maybe that's you. Maybe you know the gospel, and you want to live well right under the powerful effect of the gospel, but you don't know how. You want to live righteously. You want to live in holiness. You believe in Christ as your Savior, but now you're left with, okay, what do I do today? What do I do tomorrow? How do I live as a new creation? Well, let's see. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. I think within this passage, you'll see three evaluative things, as you might wonder, am I being formed or disciplined in the gospel and by the gospel? And that'll serve as my next three points or three subpoints. First, or A, if you're using an outline on the back of your bulletin, Paul is calling you, Paul is calling all of us as Christians to be disciplined in the right direction. That can help you answer, am I being formed or disciplined by the gospel? Are you going in the right direction? Are you being aimed at the right thing? Now, the Christian life, all of our Christian lives have a particular aim. We have a goal that we want to achieve with an aim or a direction that's been set for us. And that direction we see in verse 24 of the passage, our direction is toward or after What's written there? True righteousness and holiness. So the end of the Christian's life, the the pursuit of the Christian life, you imagine yourself running down a football field. Where are you running down this football field? Well, hopefully you're running toward the end zone, right? And the Christian life is running toward righteousness and holiness. But not only righteousness and holiness, what does it say there? Whose righteousness and holiness? It says the likeness of God, where it's God's holiness and righteousness That is the object of our faith. He is the likeness of our pursuit. Now, the great church reformer John Owen writes that love begets a likeness between the mind, love, and the object, beloved. A mind filled with love of Christ as crucified will be changed into his likeness. And we see that promise given to us in the scripture where love begets a likeness between the mind, and the object that is loved. And I think it's incredibly cool to think about. As I focus my attention, as I aim myself at God's righteousness and holiness, I am falling in love and being formed into the likeness of Christ himself. If we want to be godly or Christ-like, our attention must be exclusively on Christ and him crucified, the text here says. Now, if you're here and you're not a Christian this morning, If you just came in with a friend or you stumbled in because you wanted to try church out this morning, you know you're not a believer in Jesus. What is your life's direction? Like, what is the end for you? As a Christian, we should say that our end is holiness and righteousness because we want to serve God well. What is is the end of you? What is your aim? Maybe it's security or satisfaction or pleasure or friends or success. Uh, What is that? Ours is supposed to be, as Christians, righteousness and holiness, but what is yours? And and how do you expect that to wind up, or how do you expect that to end? For all of us, I I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, turn back or left a little bit, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, where we see this taught to us, not just by wisdom, like someone by John Owen, but also from the very words of God, where 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, tells us, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. It's an incredible celebration of what is happening to a Christian who places themselves under formative church discipline. Now, personally, you should pursue this, Christian. You should pursue being formed by the gospel by having your aim be God's righteousness and God's holiness, aiming your heart, devoting your heart toward God Almighty. And the effect we see in this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 
or yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we see the effect of this is actually a transformation, not just of ourselves, but a transformation into his likeness or into his image. Not only personally should you do this, but also collectively. Think about our church as a whole. This should be our church's aim, disciplining one another toward Christ crucified. And so you might think of the ways that we do things. And I think it's good for us always and regularly to ask ourselves, are we training ourselves towards God's righteousness and holiness? Is this program that we do great and fun, but not necessarily shaping us into the likeness of the Son? Leave it to the YMCA to do that, or leave it to a civic club to do that. Because whenever we gather, whenever we gather in small groups or in a couple of people, whether you're studying the Bible with someone else or you're coming here on a Sunday morning uh, before church for Sunday school or your kids are participating in Awana, are we collectively discipling, disciplining one another toward Christ crucified, where the display of the gospel in full includes this purpose of our lives together? And I wonder if how you think of uh, this and pertaining to possibly jumping into a life group or walking, waking up an hour earlier and attending a class on Sunday morning, or even budgeting your grocery bill to include others at your table once in a while because we know that we've been called for together to pursue, the, to pursue God's holiness and righteousness. Or maybe staying after the service, like five extra minutes, and asking someone how you can pray for them. Friend, is God worthy of your daily desire? Yes. Is he esteemed enough to receive your consideration? within your circumstances? Yes. Is he good enough to receive your entire obedience? Yes. And if you answer no to any of those questions within any of your own personal characteristics, you know, what makes you you? Well, where you live, what you buy, how you speak, how you live, what you drink, what you eat, how you fellowship. If you can answer no because of those things, then you're not being disciplined towards righteousness and holiness. But the Bible actually says that you're being disciplined and trained by your own flesh towards sin and ultimately will wind up in despair. Friends, God has called all of us collectively and individually to pursue righteousness and holiness. And he doesn't mean at this snippet of your life and not the others, but with our whole lives, with everything that he's provided for us. Brothers and sisters, let's be trained and disciplined towards God's righteousness and holiness, not because it's the best option, but because along with being the best option, because along with his striking holiness and outstanding righteousness is also his consuming and begetting love, mercy, joy, grace, and peace. And what an amazing thing to be disciplined by in pursuing God. So we want to be, or we want to have the right aim in being disciplined uh, collectively. So in our passage in Ephesians 4, Paul is calling you to be disciplined in the right direction. But he's also, secondly, uh, calling you to be disciplined by the right power. So he's calling you to be disciplined by the right power. Turn back to Ephesians 4 in verse 22. You'll see two words starting there. You'll see two words there that should fuel or encourage your desire to direct your aim on God's righteousness and holiness. So you might think, okay, I know I'm supposed to go to his righteousness. I know I'm supposed to pursue his holiness, but I'm tired or I'm weak or I don't know how I'll get there or I'm not a very strong person. But these two words, you, he says, you who are in Christ, you who have, according to verse 21, heard about Christ, were taught in him. You who who put off your old self are being, the first word there, renewed. And the second word, You who are putting on a new self are created. You are to be renewed and created toward then the likeness of God. We see here a righteous and right power that is given to God's people that encourages us toward the right aim. So you know you're called to be disciplined not just toward something, but also by something. And you're to be disciplined by what? In order to aim at righteousness and holiness. We are often tempted to be powered by our own talent or our own power or our own instincts or maybe even by our acquired knowledge. But none of that will ultimately fuel our fire towards perfect righteousness and holiness. But these two words, renewed and created, these are both passive verbs, meaning an object is renewing another object. 
or an object is creating another object. And in our understanding of directionally aiming for righteousness and holiness, there is a power outside of us that internally directs and fuels us. And that power or that person is the very Spirit of God. The very person who regenerates, think about this, the very foreign object who regenerates your hard heart and makes you new is still the same person who is fueling your pursuit towards righteousness and holiness. In Christ, and because of His work, you have been made new by the Spirit. And by the Spirit, your heart is being renewed in the direction of Christ. God, in His continual grace, provides power, enabling us to live godly lives. So you may look at God's righteousness and holiness, and you may think a formative church discipline and go, too big of a task. I can't do it. And you need to be honest, you on your own flesh and blood cannot do it. You on your own flesh and blood cannot pursue righteousness and holiness. You will constantly be battling the flesh that you have brought on yourself, but the Spirit of God pointing you to the righteousness of Christ very much can. Jerry Bridges in his book on spiritual disciplines says that it is encouraging to your walk in faith By understanding the source of power for Christ-like character is Christ. And so the means of experiencing that power through our relationship with Christ is brought to us by God's very Spirit. Turn to Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. Actually, don't turn there. I'll read it for you because I already got there. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Our power towards righteousness and holiness comes from us setting aside our own wisdom, setting aside our own strength, setting aside our own glory, and instead drawing from the very power of God the Spirit. Hopefully this directs your own prayers, where you call out to God, Oh God, give me your spirit, and his power to fill in the blank. Love my husband. Be honest on my taxes. Trust you with my empty wallet. Have a pure tongue. God, you know the sharp words that my flesh have, and give me your spirit that presents peace. Or to be full of joy even in my singleness. Calling on the Lord to fuel you and power you. To live in Christ is to be powered by God. And so to be disciplined biblically is to be disciplined by the right power that God has given us. Paul's calling you to be disciplined in the right direction towards righteousness and holiness, and also by the right power. But thirdly and finally, you're to be spiritually disciplined with the right action. So not just having the right aim, not just be powered by the right stuff, but also you yourself must have the right action in pursuing holiness and righteousness. You yourself must act in formative church discipline. So you're not just randomly pointing in the right direction or effortlessly fueled by the right power. You're not just sitting on like a, one of those ski lifts that takes you from way down in the bottom miraculously all the way to the top. That's not what your life is ever called to look like in pursuance. It's the Spirit giving the power. But you're to not grieve the Spirit or go against God's desire for your life, either passively or on purpose. You're to be disciplined toward godliness with the right action. And that right action is given to us so clearly in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. Let me read it again. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Christians are called to act toward righteousness and holiness by putting off the old self and putting on the new self. This is the work of the Christian. For the context here, Paul leans on the the readers of this letter. He leans on their own experience where he said that they have learned Christ. Not learned about Christ, but have learned Christ. To learn Christ means you have a personal relationship with him. And with their personal relationship with Christ, they're to put off the old self, meaning their sinfulness that once separated them from Christ and his glory. Their former way of living, which we see in the scriptures and in this context, was selfish or self-centered or prideful or wicked or sexually deviant. 
They're to put off corrupt, deceitful desires, those things that that should have brought them eternal punishment in hell, but by the grace of God, they have been saved from those thoughts and actions to a new life, so they put on a new life. And because of Christ's salvific work, by the power of the Spirit, they're to put on the new self, or to put on the resurrected life. They're to put on the newly created life, where they now have God's Spirit living in them. Paul does not leave our daily life and our ongoing effort in the dark here. So you might just hear the words like, okay, I'm to put off, and then I'm to put on, and I don't really understand what that means. Paul has no idea what I go through on a daily basis. He has no idea who's in my family. You know, none of that. He doesn't leave us in the dark, though. He actually gives us instruction. He says, put off and put on. That's our daily action. That's our daily work. That's our effort towards righteousness and godliness. But see, after this passage, how he so quickly applies it in the case that we in the case that we might be spiritually clouded. Look down just a little bit at verse 25. Think about your own integrity. He says, put off falsehood and put on truthfulness. Think about your own hands. And verse 28, put off stealing. And put on hard work and also a generous spirit. And look at verse 29. Think about your mouth. Put off filthy, derogatory speech and put on a mouth that speaks grace and goodness. And finally in verse 30, think about your own heart. Put off grieving the Holy Spirit and put on what he'll address later in chapter 5. Put on the idea of being controlled by the Spirit, not of worldly devire, device, or not of worldly vices or devices, but rather put on the Spirit rather than grieving against him. Now, as an aside here, uh, putting off and putting on needs to be done in a balanced form. Now, all of us are going to have tendencies to be very good at putting stuff off or putting stuff on. And by that I mean we're taught in Hebrews 1 that God loves righteousness and he hates wickedness. And some of us tend to emphasize one over the other. Some of us can be tempted to be great at putting off things like vices or uh, stations of immorality. And we actually lack the work of putting on things like love and joy and patience with other people who may just be one step behind us. But this action of putting off and putting on is commanded in full. I'm going to use an illustration here that just came to mind, which means it's probably not a good one, but let's see if it works. I want you to imagine yourself playing a video game, and where the character of this video, I can already feel it going off course, where the character of this video game is in one of those, you know, medieval, Narnia, Lord of the Rings settings where everyone kind of looks like an alien creature, and just before you are, are these things that will help you fight the enemy. You know, in Mario Brothers, it's like a banana or an apple or something like that. But you're, you're in the real world setting where you are fighting off like sin and despair and evil. So before you might be a, a shield that you can pick up or a helmet that you can grab onto or maybe fuel or food that can get you through the day. But when you go up to those, part of the game is that in order to grab that helmet, you actually have to take something off and leave it behind. And so you weigh the costs. Does that helmet look like a helmet of truth? And what would I have to take off to gain that helmet or grab that sword so I can fight off the enemy? Well, I have to strip this off of my own life. And you go through weighing the consequences of those. And we go through that all the time of I have this option in front of me to pursue righteousness and holiness, but in order to do so, I've got to actually put these other things off or to forgive someone who has so sinned against you. Like, I I want to forgive them, but I really want to hold on to that anger, don't I? Because once I forgive them and let go of that anger, I no longer have a sword that I can hack them away with. This example got kind of dark there for a second, but going through life, this is what the Christian effort looks like. God provides you with spiritual fruit, things like truth, things like righteousness, things like love and wisdom, and we're to put those things on. But in order to do that, you've got to take some things off or put some things away because you can't carry them both with you. You can't put on truth and keep lies. You can't put on trust and keep worry. You can't put on purity and hold on to a life of being perverted. Paul, God's apostle, for the building up of this church, calls us, calls you, friend, to be disciplined, to be formed, to pursue righteousness and holiness by righteousness, by his righteousness and holiness, and with his righteousness and holiness. We all have been given an aim, and we're to stir one another up with those effects. We're to aim ourselves toward that and also help aim other people to that. I'm reminded of uh, an old saint who asked their pastor in a Q&A, 
And she looked just very distraught because she said, I've lived 92 years and I still sin. Will I ever stop sinning? And the pastor just very politely and quietly said, you won't on this side of life, but you will dislike it more and more. And you will be in a place one day where there will be no sin and you will be no sin. And the only thing that you'll have in front of you is the joy of God's righteousness, his purity, and his holiness. And in the meantime, put away those sinful desires, but look forward to the time of true hope that we have with Jesus. Friends, let's pray together. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we are grateful that you love us in such a way that you discipline us, that you love us in such a way that uh, you correct us and you admonish us toward righteousness, you encourage us toward holiness, you strengthen us to pursue that. God, we ask that you would give us a clear aim of what pursuing you with righteousness and holiness looks like. We pray that you would give us a true trust of your spirit, that we would cling to him and be enabled by him to pursue you in your glory. And we pray that you would remind us of what we need to put off and what we have and can put on. Oh Lord, we we ask now as we approach your table, our Lord's table, that you would remind us of all the things that your son brought on himself and conquered with his death. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.